class number three, physics of musical instruments. After first class, everyone is expected to know that things vibrating in air produce sound waves. But just in case, this type of vibrations are called free running. That is, equilibrium is disturbed and the system returns to it after oscillations die out. Some musical instruments produce this sound by allowing free running oscillations. Running oscillations emit some note, say a drum's membrane. When hit, it goes in a free running oscillation. But a membrane vibrates not just in one, but in many oscillation modes, each having its own frequency, and a lot of them are excited when hit. These are called overtones. All these vibrations add up to a non-periodic mess that does not qualify as a note. Most vibrations around us have hundreds of overtones and do not qualify as notes. However, free-running oscillations on strings do qualify as notes. Strings also have overtones, but there's something special about these overtones. Unlike the membranes, all their frequencies are integral multiples of the fundamental. That is, they share the same period. Then they're not just overtones, but harmonics. Only standing waves composed by harmonics are really periodic. And what's the big deal about overtones being multiples of a fundamental? Uh, that's a fair question. You see, some energy from these standing waves escape their boundaries as sound waves that can be heard. Our brain is especially good at processing patterns. Periodic waves are special patterns that go straight to emotions. As neuroscientist Seth Harowitz puts it, We are emotional creatures and emotions are evolutionary. Fast responses. Things you don't have to think about. Sequences of those periodic waves are what we know as music. That's why those special overtones are called harmonics, because they become the basis of musical harmony, and those periodic waves are called notes or tones. Musical instruments can play a tune using either strings or pipes. Besides free running, oscillations may also be driven continuously by some external force. But according to the mass involved and how strong the spring or how tense the string, some frequencies are more welcome than others. In other words, the driving force can produce stronger oscillations depending on how near its frequency is to the system's resonance frequency. Hate it when he steals my lines. Yes, Sebastian resonance frequency. Let's watch Resonance in the Making.
This is the cello. It uses a resonance of 10 strings to produce notes. Same principles used by the violin, the viola, and the bass. Here's how it works. The violin bow when propped against the microphone. Produces noise, which has a frequency composition like this one. The frequency composition of a sound, it's called its spectrum. Noise has a continuous spectrum, meaning that it has a frequency component on every frequency. However, the violin filters that sound and only the frequencies that match the resonance of the vibrational modes of the violin will be heard. Unless there's too much damping, the resonance frequency is the same as that in which the system will oscillate freely. The violin is sometimes played without the bow, in a style called pizzicato. It consists in plucking the string and allow it to do free-running oscillations. The pitch of the pizzicato is the same as when played with the bow. So again, the resonant frequency is about the same as that when it oscillates freely. The instruments in the entire wind section use resonance. Pressure waves can travel along a pipe, the same as in a string, and uh, standing waves can be created inside a short pipe, same as in the string. A pipe has vibrational modes. Same as a string, right? Exactly. Here are some modes for a pipe that is closed at both ends. B, the pipe's closed. Then no sound can come out, right? You're absolutely right. There won't be any sound. However, standing waves also happen in open-ended pipes. They are only weird implementations of open-ended strings, and these have no practical value in string instrument design. This one proves that there can be standing waves in single open-ended strings. Also possible are double open-ended strings, which allow the even harmonics to show up. The same oscillation modes exist in open-ended pipes, only here some energy can escape the sound waves. The flute is a pipe open at both ends. The pipe is shortened when the holes are opened by the keys, and this changes the vibrational modes. The one shown here is the modern concert flute, but it's the oldest musical instrument and has been around since the Stone Age. The organ pipes are also open at both ends. The keyboard selects which pipes to activate. Other wind instruments like the clarinet are open in only one end, allowing no even harmonics in its spectrum. What about the trumpet? The trumpet makes a very poor teaching example. It evolved from a signaling device 
to a musical instrument only after the 14th century. The trumpet should have been like a clarinet, but the bell raises the lower resonant frequencies like the third to the fourth, and the mouthpiece does the opposite to the high resonances. The result being that it approximates the full harmonic series, and the skill of the player makes the final effect. <laughs> There's still a very ancient instrument we have not talked about. Here's a hint. Obviously, it's the human voice. Uh, by the way, is it a window string instrument? I would say it's a string one, because harmonics are generated by the vocal cords and not by air column resonance. Just as the violin's body, the larynx mouth cavity enhances some harmonics while others are attenuated, and that changes the spectrum of the voice. Wonders of technology, video cameras have become so small that it may be possible to see the vocal cords in action. A few muscles make all the necessary changes in tension and proximity to produce the voice. Some amazing piece of engineering, right? It is the relative amplitude of the harmonics would call us the sound of an instrument and allow us identifying it. The color is also known as the timbre. It is the timbre what allows not just to identify which musical instrument is playing, but also that of recognizing someone's voice. Here's the sound of a flute and a saxophone. Can you tell which is which? A professional musician may have no trouble with this question, but it may not be easy for an untrained ear. That's what it was. What about now? I'm sure you had no difficulty in identifying the sax of the great Paquito de Rivera or the exquisite flute of Elizabeth Wetland. It is not just the timbre that gives away the instrument that's playing, there are other clues like the envelope. The attack, decay, sustain, and release. The envelope describes the way the amplitude varies in time, which is different in every instrument. There's no sustain, and there's no release. Well, this is about it for this class. Not much more can be said about musical instruments in 15 minutes. Next class is about acoustic beats. These are produced when two perfectly pure sounds add up in the air. The resulting wave is one with the average of both frequencies, and its amplitude modulated with their difference. If that's only slight difference, what you hear is just that, a pure sound with fluctuating intensity. But when that difference grows to be within the human hearing range, it is perceived as a third sound component, and then it gets real.